Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service once again this evening. I'm glad you joined us. We're going to start in singing some praise and worship songs this evening. I ask that you stand and join us as we worship. I'll um, open in a word of prayer before we start. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church body to worship you together. To worship to you together as one, we count it a privilege that we can do this. God, as we sing about your love and sing about what you've done on the cross for us, I pray that you would give us new revelation in our minds and in our hearts of what that means for us personally. God, we want to connect with you this evening. I pray that you would help us to focus on you as we spend time in worship. We praise you this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Join in as we sing together. And on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And, and I love. I'll cherish the old rugged cross Until my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross Left 
we can truly say thank you for the cross, for what you've done in our lives, for redeeming us. God, we worship you for that this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining in. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to church. It's great to see you all out this evening. We have a few more people, not uh, the snowstorm we had last Saturday evening, so it is good to see you. Welcome here online joining us. We welcome you to our service this evening as well. Over the past month or maybe five weeks or so, we've been uh, seeing little video clips of what Samaritan's Purse is all about, Operation Shoebox. And so today's the deadline, and so these are going to be getting shipped all over the place, or shipped to Calgary, first of all, for us, and then from there it'll be moving all over the place. Um, So what we wanted to do, though, is because it's a pretty special ministry to us as a church, uh, we just want to do a prayer of sending, and and we know that uh, from the testimonies that we've heard, they have these little boxes uh, make significant impacts into lives of many children. And uh, growing up to serve God in so many different areas. There's so much power behind these little gifts of love. And not only that, but they get to, um, they get to take a, some club and, and learn about Jesus. And, and that's, that's why we um, support this ministry. That's why we get behind it. Because it's a great ministry of, of sharing the love of Jesus with so many people all around the world. Our, our mission here at Ozer Mission Chapel is to create communities where people are transformed by Jesus, and by doing that, we do it all over the world. It's an exciting opportunity. So this evening, I've got a few boxes here, and, and I just invite you to, to pray with me as we send these boxes, and, and uh, uh, God's blessing would go with them, and um, people's lives would be changed. Pray with me. Dear, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to give, and to give such an amazing cause. Thank you for Uh, the thousands of people that have heard about Jesus because of these little shoe boxes. And thank you that we can take part in it. And so as we send the boxes that have been collected from our church, um, God, we we pray that you would work and move in the lives of the the, the people that will receive those boxes, that uh, their lives will be transformed, that they will... uh, they will be followers of Jesus through uh, getting this little gift and being able to uh, be discipled for, for, uh, for a year as well. So God, we just, as they go, we just pray that you would do a mighty work in the lives of those people that receive these gifts. We pray this in, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. What a privilege and opportunity. Speaking of opportunity, we have another opportunity. This is a great, um, great ministry opportunity that is so dear to my heart. The Teen Challenge, typically they have their gala this time of year, but due to COVID, of course, that's going moving to a virtual gala, and uh, I've gotten to know some of the staff at Teen Challenge quite well, and their stories are so powerful, and uh, I I love them dearly, and so uh, this is an opportunity for you to get involved, and how you can get involved is you as an individual or as a family can uh, sign up. It is $25 uh, for a single viewing, or you can invite some friends and uh, have a, a viewing party at $125. So incredible ministry, uh, and what they will be doing is they will be sharing testimonies of people who have graduated from Teen Challenge, and they will be doing some singing, and of course, uh, just letting you know of what's been going on in Teen Challenge. Probably a really good update this year, as they've been battling with COVID as well, and, and it's and it's taken its toll on some of their students as well. And so um, take, take note of that, Teen Challenge. And I believe that's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. it starts. So there is, uh, you can check it out online. There's a couple of posters throughout the church that you can take advantage of that. Please do. 
The other thing, again, on our music stands by the doors, there is it's our annual elections, so please take note of that. You can drop them in the white box in the back as well. And then not this Monday, but the following Monday on the 23rd, I believe it is, we'll have our, uh, a congregation meeting. And what we're looking at is we're looking at our board structure and process review. So there's two, two different um, uh, packets of information available. This is going to be the summary. If, if you just want a, a summary of what it is, what it looks like, we discussed it, this at our annual general meeting in March, I believe. And if you enjoy the legal information and uh, you can go through the board governance and, and policy manual that is available at the information center so those those are available T take note of that and plan plan to be here for that meeting on the 23rd it's an important meeting a very important meeting today in the life of our church lots of things were happening There was a wedding here at the church in the afternoon, and uh, there was a memorial service in Warman uh, this afternoon for Elmer Bear. We prayed for him last Sunday, sorry, last Saturday evening, and by 8.30 that evening, he had gone to be with Jesus. And uh, so this afternoon, I had the privilege of speaking at the memorial service for him. If you want to find this, uh, you, can, you can find it online. I know there's, there's been a few challenges going through the Funeral Home website. But I posted on our Facebook website um, the stream. Uh, it's, uh, oh, what is it called? Faith Productions. If you go to faithproductions.com, the first one on there, uh, I believe, should be Elmer Bears. And uh, you can, if you want to take part of the, in the memorial service, you can do that. He was, for, for those of you who don't know, who are newer, he was uh, one of our faithful ushers for many, many years, and uh, a face and that lit up the room, and uh, he, is, he is well missed. He hasn't been able to attend for a number of years just to health concerns, um, but he was, um, he was just an incredible, incredible man. He was one of my mentors for, well, I've known him for about uh, three decades plus, and uh, we had an incredible relationship. And so he is at home with Jesus, away from his failing body. What a, what a day. Today we're going to continue our sermon series, Whole for the Holidays. What we're looking at today is, don't let your past mistakes define you. Don't let your past mistakes rob you of the wholeness that God has for you, that he desires for you. I believe we can probably sum it up in one word, and, and it kind of comes to this word of shame. Don't let your past... Uh, sorry, don't let the past shame in your life define who you are today and rob you of your wholeness for today and tomorrow. And it's, it's interesting that at this time of year, as we're, we're leading up to Christmas, to the holiday season, that seeing family and friends, or, or maybe even the thought of, of seeing family and friends around Christmas can remind us that we are never good enough. We um, have sin in our life, that they don't let us forget. Maybe there's something that shame in our life and, and it brings it up all over again. Seeing them for some reason causes all these feelings of shame and guilt and fear to just come rushing back and take over our lives. Now our past will certainly influence and shape who we are, but it does not have to define who you are today. Many of you who struggle with shame, fear, and guilt have tried a lot of different ways unsuccessfully to find freedom and, and leave that shame behind. Don't allow that, that past shame to suck the joy out of today and, and cripple you for tomorrow. 
Don't allow your shame to define who you are today. People try all kinds of things to leave behind this shame, to move forward from it. People try yoga, Eastern meditation. They try uh, alcohol. They try drugs. They try overeating, shopping, uh, you know, uh, gambling, overworking, self-denial. And it seems you can't keep the shame hidden far enough away. All of these things aren't enough to keep that, that shame hidden far away, suppressed enough so that it doesn't rear its ugly head from time to time. Maybe your shame comes from addiction, an addiction that you can't seem to find victory over. And I'm not just talking about drugs and alcohol. There's a ton of addictions that are out there. So whatever it is, that could be causing someone shame as well. You may be here and feel shame and guilt for something someone did to you in the past. Sexual abuse. Emotional abuse, physical abuse. And it's made you feel dirty and worthless and ashamed. Not feeling good enough. Ashamed and afraid that if people found out, what would they think of you? Maybe it's something in your past being sexually active outside of God's design for sex. And you feel the guilt and the shame. And it might be something that you did in your past that you don't want anyone to find out about it because it would be unbearable to have others know about the thing that you did, the bad things that you did. Everybody, if they found out, everybody would see the bad person that you are, how much of a fail you are. That's what, they're, that's what you're thinking. If they found out, they would see me as a failure. The struggle is absolutely real in how we deal with shame and guilt in our lives. I remember I was in a, a teenager and I got caught stealing. And I confessed to part of what I had taken but not all of it. I was trying to get away with confessing the least amount as possible because my dad was already extremely disappointed and I was incredibly ashamed of what I had done. So about a year or two later, I don't know what was going on in my life. I was dealing with the shame and the guilt of it all and I, I just, I was shaking. I was sweating profusely. My whole body was soaking wet. And I had to deal with it. There was a burning sensation. Like, it felt like there was a burning sensation inside of me. This, it was eating me up. And, and so I just went to my dad and I'm like, I can't, I can't take this. I can't hide this anymore. I have to deal with this. And so I went to him and I, I confessed to him that I had taken more than I had initially confessed to. The guilt and the shame was robbing me of my wholeness. It was keeping me just feeling bad about myself. Because what do we do? We equate stealing as bad. If it is bad and you did a bad thing, therefore we equate that with I am bad. And so that's where the guilt came in, that I am a bad person. 
My sin made me a horrible person. But that wasn't the only time I have felt guilt. In 1985, and I've shared this with you before, in 1985, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And I was not living a Christian life. And there was a lot of things I was doing. There was a lot of sin in my life, bottom line. My mom was diagnosed with cancer, and I felt guilty and ashamed because it was my sin that caused my mom to have cancer and in a few months died. That's the guilt and the shame that I was carrying around. I was ashamed because I, my sin was causing my family to lose their mom. My, my dad lost his wife and that's the shame and the guilt that I was dealing with and, and living with. And it, it was there for quite some time. See, we, there's all kinds of things that we do that cause us guilt and shame. And some of it has to do with not understanding things correctly as well. How do you move from that? How do you move away from that guilt and that shame? How do you find victory? How do you not let it rob you of your life and define who you are? Like, where do you go from there? First of all, let me just look at the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is the feeling that I did bad. Shame is the emotion that I am bad. And so we connect the two together. I did something bad, and because I did something bad, I am bad. How many people growing up in their homes or maybe at school uh, with a teacher have been told, oh, you're a bad boy, you're a bad girl. And you hear that over and over again. You hear that enough times and you begin to believe, yes, I am bad. I did a bad thing, but they're telling me that because I did a bad thing, I am a bad person. And we hear it over and over and over again. And soon we begin to believe, I am bad. And as we grow older, we still hear those same voices saying, I did all those horrible things, therefore I am a horrible person. I'm beyond hope, I'm beyond help. In fact, some people believe that because I did all of these bad things, I deserve to live with that guilt and that shame. In a sense, they they believe in karma. What comes around goes around. You get what you deserve. So if I did something bad, then I deserve to live with the shame and guilt. We believe our actions define who we are. I did something bad, therefore I am bad. And we begin, we begin to let our past mistakes become our identity. We begin to believe that I am defective. I am damaged goods. I am dirty. I'm impure. I'm unlovable. I'm unwanted. I'm a failure. I am a weak person. I'm broken. We become so hard on ourselves and in turn, we become hard on others. We see our own faults mirrored in other people and we come, become critical and, and judgmental and, and are seen as pride, proud and arrogant. Mostly, mostly we're just hurting. Often during the holidays, we're confronted with behavior from others as they lash out at at family members because of the the internal shame that they're dealing with. And so seemingly out of nowhere, someone comes becomes very critical and starts lashing out, or maybe a family member goes off and gets drunk. 
And a lot of times what we don't realize is that this can often be a really way, a, a, a very real way of escape for people who have internalized shame and have, have never done, dealt with it and they feel inadequate and, and when they see other people, when they see other family members, they feel extremely inadequate and, and it's brought to the forefront and so they are reminded again of their, their past failures and it's hard to deal with it. So they do lash out or they do get drunk or they do the thing that helps them get through that period of guilt and the shame. Well, I want to encourage you today that there is hope that you can experience from shame and guilt and fear. Jesus wants you to set you free from past mistakes, from some of those inadequacies and make you whole again. He wants to take that shame away and so that you no longer feel that I am this bad person, I am a horrible person. In the Old Testament, we, we find the example of the people of Israel. They were slaves in Egypt. They were being oppressed and they were being shamed. I mean, can you imagine living in a culture and, and being beaten every day and, and made to work harder and harder and harder and all your male children were, were killed, at, supposed to be killed at one point? But God knew their past struggle with this. He knew that they needed hope. And so he spoke to them through the prophet Isaiah, and he's going to speak to many of us tonight here as well. In Isaiah 54 verse 4, it says this. Fear not. Fear not. You will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. That is a powerful, powerful passage. I'm going to read it again, just in case you're wondering. I am reading it from the NLT translation. Isaiah 54, 4. Fear not. That is... a a phrase that is repeated over and over in the scriptures because God wanted to give us an understanding that in him we don't have to fear. You don't have to be afraid. Fear not. You will no longer live in shame. Those are incredibly encouraging words to a people that have been shamed. Oh, they might not have been in slavery anymore, but they had a slave mentality. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. If you struggle with shame in your life, if you struggle with shame, mark that verse in your Bible. Highlight that verse in your Bible. Take that verse home with you and hang it on something in your Bible to remind you that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear or have shame anymore. How can a follower, a disciple of Jesus be completely free of the shame of the past? What can take away my shame from my past? What, what is it that can take that away? Well, the world has a lot of ideas, and I mentioned some of those ideas early, earlier, how to take that shame and that guilt away. And I'm guessing that you've tried some or maybe all of those things. There's self-harm is included in that. We hurt ourselves because then somehow when we're hurting, we feel better. But there's so much shame. And I'm guessing that if you struggle with this, you've tried something, some way to get rid of it. But I'm going to propose to you today the answer to the question of what can take away my shame and make me whole again is not a religious system, is not some kind of self-help book, self-awareness program. It is not in chemicals to make us forget about the past shame, but I propose to you that the answer is in a person. In the person of Jesus Christ. 
and what that person accomplished on the cross. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is not new to you, but it's paramount to no longer living in shame, to being whole again. It's, it's paramount to understand this. Sometimes we need a reminder. We, we struggle with things of shame. Even though we are disciple of Jesus, Jesus took away the shame of sin and the guilt on the cross. Turn with me to Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And it says this. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. That is a powerful verse. When we were at the very core of our depravity as mankind, that is the very moment Jesus was waiting to take away your sins. There wasn't something that you had to do, something that you had to clean up for him to take away your sin. But when you were dead, when you were living in them, when you were right in the midst of, in the core of, in the, the, your, your sinful life, that's when he died for you. Verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away nailing it to the cross. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. There was uh, this, this, this indebtedness, but he can't, there, was a, there was a legal charge against us. There was a contract. Gary, this is Gary's sin debt. Put your name there. This is Gary's sin debt. There was a charge against me for all the sin in my life. There was a, literally a legal document. Well, not literally, figuratively. A legal document stating that I am an enemy of God. stood against us. There was nothing we could do about There was absolutely nothing that I could do about this. But right in the midst of my sin life, right in the heart of that, Jesus died for me and, 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 and simply said, you know, do you believe? Do you believe? If you believe, then I died for you. The dead is real. That's why we feel guilt and shame in our lives because this debt is real. And when someone sins against God, when someone is at odds against God, and the Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so we're all in that. So therefore, we're all legally responsible for our sin. We owe God for our sin. He's not going to be satisfied with anything less than death. We have a legal obligation. Everybody here has a legal obligation to God. And, they re and that obligation demands a response. In John 1.29, 
John recognizes Jesus. He was he came to prepare the way for this man that was coming. Someone who was greater than him. And so when John saw him coming, in John 1.29, he says, Look! Look! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look! This is significant. The Lamb of God God, who takes away the sin of the world. If this was our shame, our fear, and our guilt, and our brokenness, What he's saying is, look, the Lamb of God who literally picks up and carries off, takes it away. He he does that for us. It's gone. He takes away the sin of the world. Now in the Old Testament, lambs were killed. To make sacrifice for people's sin. The blood had to be shed. The life is in the blood. Therefore the life, the the, the, the animal had to be slain. It had to be slaughtered. But this was only temporary. They had to continue to do this, continue to do this. And in the Old Testament, they continue to prophesy. There is someone coming who is going to take away the sin of the world once and for all. And John knew that. He saw him. He said, look. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world literally picks them up and takes them away. It's like he's saying, he's saying, Gary, sin debt. This is what's going to happen to your sin debt, Gary. This is what's going to happen to your sin debt. When I take away the sin of the world and you believe in me, he's going to mark it paid in full. That contract that was out, that legal document that declared me a sinner and against God, it's declared paid in full. When? When I was dead in my sin, when I was dead in my transgressions, when I was still not living well. It didn't take or require anything from me. Here is Jesus He's the one who takes away, removes the sin of the world. The legal legal obligations that was or is, our debt is gone. He takes it away. He removes it, picks it up, carries it off. Our shame, our guilt, our sin, he's taken it away. He's nailed it to the cross. And by rising from the dead, by, by dying and defeating Sin, Satan, and death. He has victory. And the shame has been defeated. Shame is, shame is not uncommon. It, it began way back in Genesis when Adam and Eve, when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, both of them immediately, what happened? We're naked. They were ashamed. And they hid from God because of their shame. People have been dealing with this all along. And God, God sent Jesus to deal with our shame. Jesus said, I am willing to pay for your sin against God, Gary. What's your name there? I am willing to pay for your sin. Your name. God accepted Christ's payment as being enough. It's enough. I no longer have a contract that says Gary's sin debt. I 
And look, the Lamb of God who takes away your shame. Look, the Lamb of God. He canceled the charge of our illegal indebtedness that stood against us. It condemned us to eternal hell. That's what it did. But he took that away by nailing it to the cross. Therefore, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is no, now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You no longer stand condemned. Your shame, your sin, your guilt, it's been dealt with. You know what? Often we're told, just forgive yourself. You need to forgive yourself. I don't believe that. I don't believe that you have to forgive yourself because Jesus already forgave you. You are forgiven. Believe. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You are forgiven. You are no longer who you believed you were. He forgave you. Church, my desire is for all of us to be free of guilt and shame. Free from the, the sin that held us back, that maybe defines us. We're allowing it to define us even today. My desire is that we would, each one of us, would be defined by our new identity in Christ. I am a child of God. I am forgiven and free. I'm defined by my new identity in Christ, forgiven and free. I now walk in victory. That's, that's who I am. And so claim that promise that you have been forgiven and free if by faith you have believed. Would you be willing, if you're struggling with some sin and some guilt and some shame in your, shame in your life, would you be willing to leave that at the cross today? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you want that gone today? Do you want to Go home from here free. That's my desire. That's my prayer as I was preparing today that no one would go home from here with any guilt or with shame or sin in their life. Fear not. Fear not. You will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. Shortly, I'm going to give opportunity for you to symbolically leave your shame at the cross. I want you to remember that Jesus nailed it to the cross. And I want you to leave it there. I want you to walk away from here in complete victory without the shame of your past. It is his extraordinary grace that offers forgiveness of sin, freedom from fear, and restoration from shame, leaving you whole again for the holiday. And so what I'm going to ask you to do very shortly is if you would like to symbolically leave your shame and guilt at the cross today, We're going to have a closing song. We're going to listen to a closing song here in a, in a minute or two. And I'm going to give you opportunity to come. You guys can come down the different aisles. Grab one of these. This is your shame, just a, just a symbol. It's just a symbol 
of your shame and your guilt. And I want you to just drop it in the box. And you're going to leave it here. And you're going to walk away. And just because of COVID rules, what we're going to do is I'll invite you to come down these aisles, but then I'll just ask that you exit through that door. And so I'm going to pray right shortly. After the prayer, can I get the camera turned off? So that you know that no one coming up here will be on camera. And uh, so but let's pray. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have dealt with all my sin and my shame. Thank you that you were willing to die, go to the cross and die and take away all my sin and shame. I don't have to deal with that anymore. I am forgiven. And so God, I pray that each one of us would walk away from here in victory. If there's any shame or guilt that's been holding us back, Oh, Lord God, that we would leave it here, that we would walk away from here in victory and that we wouldn't come back and pick it up. But that we would leave it at the foot of the cross because you've already dealt with it. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for making it possible for us not to have to deal with our own sin other than to believe in the name of Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, we thank you for these things and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.